On March 30th, 2021, NASA's James Webb Space Telescope will blast off from the European Space Agency spaceport in Kourou, French Guiana on board an Ariane 5 rocket. It'll fly to the Sun-Earth L2 Lagrange point, a relatively stable spot in space that keeps the glare from the Sun, Earth, and Moon all in a tiny spot in the sky. Then, it'll unfurl its tennis court-sized sunshade, fold out its gigantic 6.5-meter mirror, and peer out into the distant cosmos. Over the course of the next 10 years, this infrared observatory will help astronomers learn about the earliest moments of the universe, directly observe the atmospheres of planets orbiting other stars, and peer at newly forming stars and planets. And if you listen to those words I just said with equal parts terror and skepticism, I don't blame you. James Webb's path to space has been long and tortuous, and the risks that the mission still faces are very real. Hopefully, the science will be worth it. Hopefully, nothing else goes wrong from now until deployment. So today, I want to take a deep dive into James Webb to talk about the history of the mission, why it exists, how the development went, where it stands today. I'll warn you though, the length of this video is going to go way over budget. On September 13, 1989, astronomers and scientists met at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, to discuss what the focus of space-based astronomy should be after the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. The meeting was called The Next Generation, a 10-meter class ultraviolet visible infrared successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble had yet to launch, and engineers had yet to discover the flaw in its optics. It wouldn't be until December 1993 before Hubble could truly fulfill its purpose of being a space-based telescope capable of imaging the universe in infrared, visible, and ultraviolet. And with that fix, Hubble would go on to become one of the most important and productive scientific instruments ever built by humanity. Hubble observed distant Type 1a supernova and helped astronomers discover that the expansion of the universe is accelerating, dark energy. It helped discover the first planets ever found orbiting other stars. It helped map out dark matter across the universe, discovered that there are supermassive black holes at the hearts of most galaxies, and much, much more. But what comes next? The recommendations of this initial panel were further modified as part of the 1990s Decadal Survey. This is a time when scientists come together to define their next round of science objectives. These recommendations become the foundation of the next observatories and instruments. The White House administration under President George H.W. Bush had proposed a return to the moon, transitioning to missions to Mars. So NASA asked for proposals to put this next generation space telescope on the moon instead of low Earth orbit. They proposed either a 10 meter space telescope or a 16 meter lunar based telescope capable of viewing in infrared, visible and ultraviolet. The lunar telescope could have been positioned at the moon's south pole in one of the permanently shadowed craters. This would give the telescope low temperatures, no day night cycling, and the ability to communicate with Earth, but only half the sky would be observable from this position. The next generation space telescope team ended up making a modest proposal for building a six meter cooled telescope to follow up Hubble's 2.4 meter capabilities. By being cooled, however, it would allow better observations into the infrared range while still making visible and ultraviolet observations. It would be a conservative upgrade to Hubble, but it would only cost $2 billion, so they assumed. As they continued the design, they realized that outgassing from the cooling system would enable infrared, but would limit its ability to make ultraviolet observations. So the next generation space telescope became only an infrared optical instrument. In the 1990s, a NASA panel suggested that the agency should focus on a space telescope specialized in the near infrared spectrum a region of the biggest interest to astronomers. They started with a 6.8 meter proposal and eventually settled on a 6.5 meter aperture. On March 8, 1999, work officially began on the Next Generation Space Telescope, renaming it to the James Webb Space Telescope in 2002. 
A quick side note, James Webb was the administrator of NASA from 1961 to 1968, overseeing the development of the Apollo program that brought humans to the moon in 1969. During his tenure at the space agency, they launched more than 75 robotic science and crewed missions. While NASA was settling on the final design and form of James Webb, astronomers worked to figure out what its science goals would be. These are known as the Design Reference Mission, and they would define the telescope's instruments and mission. They came up with five overall themes for the telescope. The cosmology and structure of the universe, the origin and evolution of galaxies, the history of the Milky Way and its neighbors, the birth and formation of stars, and the origin and evolution of planetary systems. And each of these themes were made up of specific science goals, and astronomers wrote up papers on the specific observations that they wanted to complete. For example, for the cosmology and structure of the universe, astronomers wanted to use James Webb to map out dark matter at the largest distances in the universe, similar to the surveys that Hubble had done at closer distances. To map out the distances to supernovae, to get a better measurement for the expansion of the universe under dark energy, to map gamma ray bursts in their galaxies, and to probe the intergalactic medium out to a time when the universe was only 500 million years old. There are similar plans to map out supernovae at different ages of the universe, the evolution of galaxies over time, searching for the oldest stars in the Milky Way and the halo of stars surrounding it, searching for cooler brown dwarfs which require a sensitive infrared instrument to see. Because its instruments can peer through gas and dust that block visible wavelengths, it will be able to look into newly forming planetary systems and reveal young stars, planetary disks, and the protoplanets embedded in them. Astronomers want to use James Webb to study the cooler objects in the Kuiper Belt. And of course, James Webb will be used to detect and characterize extrasolar planets. When the design reference mission was developed, astronomers only knew of a handful of extrasolar planets. Now, Webb will have more than 4,000 targets to look at. Astronomers anticipated that James Webb would complete half of its science goals within its first five-year mission with the rest of its time available for other observations and contributing to surprise discoveries, like studying interesting exoplanets, interstellar objects, or star-forming regions. The construction of James Webb was awarded in 2003 to a company called TRW, and they were given a budget of just over $800 million to build the telescope. TRW was then acquired by Northrop Grumman, and over the decades, its budget continued to expand. In 2010, an article in Nature described James Webb as the telescope that ate astronomy, revealing how much of the United States astronomy budget was getting gobbled up by Webb. It's really difficult to overstate how much of American astronomy's goals were riding on James Webb back then when this article was written almost 10 years ago. They still are. It all comes down to the benefits of infrared astronomy. This is an entire range of the electromagnetic spectrum that we don't see with our eyes. Visible light ranges in wavelength from 380 to 740 nanometers, but infrared is mostly measured in microns. So I'll translate that to 0.38 microns to 0.74 microns. And there are 1000 microns to the millimeter. So it's still incredibly small. Astronomers agree on three rough regions of the infrared spectrum. But these are arbitrary. It's like a rainbow of heat with three colors. Near infrared starts at 0.7 microns and goes up to 5 microns and comes with objects with a temperature range from 740 to 5200 Kelvin. We're talking about objects like cooler red stars and red giants. One of the additional advantages of near infrared is that dust becomes transparent, allowing telescopes to see objects that would usually be totally obscured in visible light. Astronomers have had the ability to observe in the near infrared spectrum with Earth based observatories for decades now. Many modern telescopes are equipped with near infrared instruments, and there are specialized observatories to focus just on these wavelengths. The next region is the mid infrared, ranging from 5 microns to 30 ish, and corresponding to temperatures in the 100 ish to 740 Kelvin. 100 Kelvin corresponds to minus 173 Celsius, so the objects emitting these wavelengths are relatively cold compared to stars, but still warmer than the background temperature of the universe itself, which is only a few degrees above absolute zero. 
objects like planets, comets, and asteroids, and dust warmed by stars. It's the light emitted by newly forming planets embedded in protoplanetary disks. Unfortunately, the Earth's atmosphere obscures mid- and far-infrared radiation, so they can only be seen with space telescopes. And to be really sensitive, the telescope needs to be cooled down to a temperature where the spacecraft's heat emissions don't interfere with the radiation it's trying to observe. Typically, this has been done with a reservoir of liquid helium, which is slowly consumed over the lifetime of a mission. In the case of James Webb, engineers went a different route putting the entire telescope in the darkest possible shadow they could create, a five-layer sunshield. Then they added a helium refrigerator. The Sun-Earth L2 Lagrange point, located 1.5 million kilometers away from us, puts the Sun, Earth, and Moon all at the same spot in the sky, and James Webb's sunshield will always be oriented to block all three. Each layer of the sunshield is made of a material called captain, and then coated in aluminum, and the two hottest layers have a treated silicon coating that reflects the sun's radiation. It works like multiple panes of glass in a window, with each layer reflecting and radiating away more and more heat, providing the darkest, deepest, coldest shadow that James Webb could possibly hope for. These layers will lower the temperature by about 300 Celsius or 570 Fahrenheit, keeping the telescope 50 Kelvin. Then, its helium refrigerator will lower the temperature down to 7 Kelvin, allowing its most sensitive instruments to function. Speaking of sensitive instruments, in order to complete its science goals, Webb has its 6.5 meter gold plated mirror designed to reflect light in the infrared spectrum. And receiving all this light is the Integrated Science Instrument Module, or ISIM. The ISIM is actually made up of four separate instruments. The fine guidance sensor is used by Webb to point as precisely as possible, for example, focusing on an exoplanet and not the brighter star that it's orbiting. This instrument acts like a guider for the telescope itself. There's the mid-infrared instrument, or MIRI, which works in the wavelengths from 5 to 28 microns. This instrument requires the additional cooling from the helium refrigerator to get down to 7 Kelvin to see the longest wavelength, coolest infrared objects. It will enable the telescope to see the most distant galaxies forming shortly after the Big Bang, brand new stars as well as comets and Kuiper Belt objects which are farther from the Sun than ever seen before, and its spectrograph will allow astronomers to know what all these objects are made of. There's the near-infrared camera. This is the primary camera that covers the infrared wavelengths from 0.6 to 5 microns. Near-infrared is the range that's just outside what we can see with our eyes. We feel it as heat with our skin. Objects which are dark, invisible light can still radiate heat in the infrared spectrum, and they're revealed with this instrument. Cooler targets like comets, dimmer red dwarf stars, as well as newly forming stars. The camera is also equipped with a coronagraph to block the light from stars and reveal objects orbiting around them, like planets. This is the instrument that astronomers will use to look at the atmospheres of exoplanets. Finally, the near-infrared spectrograph is obviously a spectrograph. These are some of the most valuable instruments for astronomers since they break up light into a spectrum. And from this fingerprint, astronomers can actually see what chemicals it's made of. For example, detecting oxygen in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, or the presence of heavier elements in a distant galaxy. James Webb will be imaging thousands of these distant galaxies in its mission. And this spectrograph can reveal the fingerprints of 100 objects at the same time. It does this using an electromechanical system called a micro-shutter array, each of which is the width of human hair. The cells can be opened or closed to see or block various parts of the sky and isolate the exact parts astronomers want to study. I've talked about the history, purpose, and instruments on board James Webb, but I'm sure you're wondering, how good will it be? What will it allow astronomers to do that they couldn't already do with Hubble? Will it be worth billions of dollars and decades of work? We'll get to that in a second, but first I'd like to thank Ziegert, Archonite, Mark Wittick, and the rest of our 831 patrons for their generous support. Instead of sponsors, we have patrons. This gives us the freedom to tackle topics that make us curious, and you can be a part of this. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today, and you'll see our videos early as well as bloopers and behind the scenes videos. All this money, all this time, 
Is it going to be worth it? What will James Webb do that Hubble can't? First, it's important to note that Hubble sees near infrared, visible and ultraviolet, while James Webb sees mid infrared and near infrared. It can actually see in the visible spectrum a bit too in the red and a little into the yellow. So they only slightly overlap in their capabilities. Hubble can see things that James Webb can't and vice versa. So we're comparing planets to moons here. James Webb's mirror is 6.5 meters across compared to Hubble's 2.4 meters. This gives James Webb 15 times more collecting area. One of the ways that astronomers measure the capabilities of a telescope is in its angular resolution. James Webb will see in the infrared wavelength at an angular resolution of 0.1 arc seconds. Just to give you an idea of how small this is, that would allow it to see a soccer ball located about 550 kilometers away. A better comparison would actually be NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope, which had a 0.85 meter aperture and a resolution of about two arc seconds. Spitzer gave us pictures like this and pioneered the science of studying exoplanet atmospheres. James Webb will take those studies to the next level, seeing not only atmospheres, but the signature of liquid water on rocky planets. The universe is expanding. The light that's taken the longest to reach us has gotten its wavelength redshifted towards the red end of the spectrum. The cosmic microwave background radiation started out as red, and now it's shifted into the microwave spectrum. And the most distant galaxies have gotten redshifted into the infrared spectrum. Webb will be able to look at galaxies and see them as they appeared about 500 million years after the Big Bang. Hubble has observed a few of these galaxies, but it's needed a special trick using the gravity of a foreground galaxy cluster to act as a lens. But James Webb will see them anywhere it looks. When it does its version of the ultra deep field observing for 100 hours per filter, it'll be able to see galaxies forming just 250 million years after the Big Bang. While Hubble was able to see examples of early galaxies, James Webb will be able to see as many as it has time to observe to help astronomers understand how the early universe came together. I've talked about the next round of mega telescopes under construction here on Earth, including the 39 meter European extremely large telescope. It will also be equipped with infrared instruments and adaptive optics to make the Earth's atmosphere disappear but they can only observe out to a wavelength of 2.5 microns. Beyond that, the heat from the Earth and its atmosphere obscure the view. James Webb will be able to go out to 28.5 microns. You can only do that from space. I'm recording this video in November 2019, and the total budget allocated to Webb so far and into the future is $8.8 billion. And when you add in the operating costs for its first 5.5 year mission, the total budget will be 9.66 billion. James Webb has enough fuel and coolant on board to extend its mission another five years after that, lasting for a total of 10 years in space. You've probably heard that in 2018, NASA performed an in-depth review of progress on James Webb to see why it was taking so long and how it had gone so far over budget. After their intense evaluation of Northrop Grumman's progress, NASA calculated that a realistic launch date would be March 30th, 2021. In August 2019, the telescope was fully assembled for the first time, connecting the two halves of the spacecraft together. And in October 2019, the telescope's sun shield was fully extended and tested for the last time on Earth. The next time it deploys, it'll be in space. Up next are a series of final electrical and mechanical tests, one final deployment test, and then the telescope will be packed up and shipped off to ESA's launch facility in French Guiana for its flight to space. Hindsight is 2020, of course. Now that James Webb is billions over budget and years late, it's fair to ask if it was the right direction to go at all. The evolution of the early universe is a key question in astronomy, and this is the only tool for that job. But knowing now what price they'd pay for the answer, astronomers might have been willing to push the question down the road a few decades. But it's too late. The telescope is built, and now we're just over a year away from its flight to space. Hopefully the lessons learned in the construction of Webb will inform the next generation of space telescopes like Louvoir and Habex. 
Match that with the decreased launch costs on reusable launch vehicles like Starship, and we could see future telescopes with much more capabilities be launched for a fraction of the price of James Webb. For now, it's time to watch its progress with bated breath. And when that Ariane 5 lifts off from French Guiana carrying its precious, irreplaceable cargo, let's hope for a safe journey. Good luck, Webb. We're counting on you. What do you think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Here are the names of the patrons who support us at the $10 level and more. Want to see your name here and support the work we do? Go to patreon.com slash universe today. Once a week, I gather up all my space news into a single email newsletter and I send it out. It's got pictures, brief highlights about the story and links you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format? So you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up right on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com slash audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. James Webb is just one of the many ground and space-based telescopes in the works. Here's a video we did all about space telescopes that come after James Webb.